Elizabeth, thank you. The fallout tonight from the unthinkable. The head of the United States Secret Service quits. What comes next? Who's leading the agency for the moment? What Donald Trump is saying after nearly losing his life. Plus, out on the road in a swing state for the first time. Day two of the new campaign for Kamala Harris. And in this campaign, I promise you, I will proudly put my record against his any day of the week. Official without a spectacle within hours and what Trump is saying in his first comments about his new opponent. Also tonight, the president back at the White House starting his lame duck term. One of the White House's longest serving physicians tells us why he thinks aging in the White House is a problem. This is The Hill on News Nation. And good evening, I'm Blake Berman. Welcome to Washington tonight, where the head of the Secret Service is out. And now the head of the Department of Homeland Security is under scrutiny. The Secret Service Director Kimberly Cheadle resigning today, 10 days after an assassin's bullet nearly claimed Donald Trump's life and a day after she appeared before Congress to bipartisan outrage. A temporary successor, the agency's number two, Ronald Rowe Jr., is now in charge. And this is just some of what's before him. Right now, the Secret Service has to protect President Biden, Vice President Harris, Donald Trump, his vice presidential selection, J.D. Vance, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who just received protection in the recent days, whoever Vice President Harris will choose as her running mate, probably here in the upcoming days, and their families, on top of all the other responsibilities the Secret Service currently has. President Biden saying today in a statement in part, quote, we all know what happened that day can never happen again as we move forward. I wish Kim all the best, and I will plan to appoint a new director soon. Now, Donald Trump responded with a new position today, arguing, quote, the Biden-Harris administration did not properly protect me, and I was forced to take a bullet for democracy. It was my great honor, he says, to do so. And tonight, as the director is out, a temporary replacement is in. Some Republicans are now wondering why Alejandro Mayorkas the head of the Department of Homeland Security, remains on the job. Joining us now is the Republican congressman from the state of Florida, Greg Stubbe. Congressman, thanks for being with us here on the Hill. Appreciate the time, yeah. sir, uh, and thank you for running to the camera because I know votes just, just started. Um, let's start with Alejandro yeah, exactly. Mayorkas. You got it. Let's start with Alejandro Mayorkas. They are, there are calls right now for him to resign. He's the head of the Department of Homeland Security. He said this earlier this week, and I'll get your reaction on the other side. I have 100% confidence in the director of the United States State Secret Service. I have 100% confidence in the United States Secret Service. Kimberly Cheadle is out. Congressman, what should happen to Alejandro Mayorkas? Well, he's already been impeached in the House. He should be removed by the Senate. He should have been removed by the Senate for the invasion that we have at our southern border. But uh, Chuck Schumer is playing politics and, and isn't going to do that. So, uh, you know, we have the Secret Service director that has resigned. Alejandro Mayorkas refused on multiple occasions Trump's team's request for additional security. And they didn't honor that. They refused that. Uh, I'd hate to think that that's political, but it sure seems like that like it is. Uh, Biden and Kamala you think Harris they're making have Political decisions on, they on need. Donald Trump's security? Uh, I would certainly take that from the information that we have at this point, but the Secret Service refuses to give us any information that we've requested. The House uh, Committee on Oversight has requested a whole litany list of information when she was here yesterday. She basically just threw her hands up and said, oh, we're, we're looking at that. It was very specific requests of information that we have the ability in Congress to get. Um, we should get that information and uh, make those decisions. So the Secret Service director, Congressman, is not a Senate-confirmed position, which means that person is appointed by the president. Whoever the president may be, a Democratic president in the White House, a Republican president in the White House. And there's some of your colleagues on the other side of the aisle, a, a bipartisan uh, proposal in the Senate that would require Senate confirmation of the Secret Service director. Do, do you think that Congress should get involved via the Senate with this election, or... Is this just up to, to the president 
and the head of the Department of Homeland Security to figure out who should be the top boss there. Well, they're still accountable to Congress, just like you had her here yesterday uh, for a hearing. She refused to come today because she resigned. We still have oversight authority on every agency in, in the administration. So whether it's confirmed by the Senate or not, we still have the ability to impeach them. We still have the ability to do oversight. We, we still have the ability to subpoena information from an agency of the federal government. Uh, and I think that's what this task force that... Uh, Speaker Johnson is appointing is going to do is try to get a lot of this information that they're refusing to give to Congress as of today. I want to get into the money here for a second, Congressman. 2024 budget, $3 billion, basically $1.1 billion for protection, 3,200 special agents. I know Republicans in this town often talk about the need to cut spending and to cap spending, but does the Secret Service need money? Do they need more funding? Well, if they do, that's not cert certainly not something that she's requested of us. Uh, when she was at the hearing, that's not a, an issue that she raised as being an issue why that we had this attack and assassination attempt on President Trump. Uh, we, Republicans, gave more money to the Department of Defense while cutting spending in other areas. So for this Republican, obviously the safety and security of the American people comes paramount before other things that we fund in the federal government. We can certainly okay. cut the $400 million that we send to Jordan's border security and secure our own border. We can certainly reallocate money that we sent to other countries uh, to secure our border here and do other things to the defense of our nation. You know, let me ask you about something that just happened to a member on the other side of the aisle, Congressman Dan Kildee. There are pro-Palestinian pro protests that are happening uh, in the Capitol that happened earlier today. Congressman Kildee, who's a Democrat from Michigan, I want to show our audience the scene. Uh, there were protests you could see there in the Capitol, and his office said that they needed help from Capitol Police to basically stop those folks from getting into their office. As a lawmaker, do you feel safe? Do you feel that, that Capitol Police writ large needs to be beefed up? Well, my first question is, is why did all these individuals be let into the Capitol when you know that they were going to protest? That right behind me, right down here in the rotunda, there was huge protests. Uh, were so loud that your camera crews couldn't take hits down here because there were so many people chanting and all of them got arrested and removed. Why were they let into the building? You knew what they were going to try to do. All of the buildings, unless you have staff access uh, during this period of time, should have been shut down because you know they all have been talking about coming up here and protesting. Tomorrow's going to be even worse. You've got barricades all around the Capitol, but my first question would be, why let people in to the Capitol you buildings that you know this? are going to cause a... I'm sorry? Do, would you want to investigate stuff like this? Well, that's something for the House Administration Committee that's over the sergeant's office and over the Capitol Police to determine. Okay. I mean, that, that, but the bottom line is, is people that are going to cause a, cause a scene and be kicked out because they're unlawfully doing things in the Capitol they're not allowed to do uh, should be kicked out and held accountable for that, which a whole bunch of them just were. All right. Congressman Greg Stubbe, uh, Republican from the state of Florida. Thanks for being with us here on the Hill and running to the camera. Appreciate the time, sir. Yep. Thanks for having me. You got it. All right. Joining me today throughout the hour here on the Hill, Scott Bolden, News Nation political contributor, Ashley Davis, a former official in the George W. Bush uh, administration. Kurt Bardella, News Nation contributor, and Aaron Perini <laughs> is a Republican strategist. Hello to you all. Nice to have you all in uh, on this Tuesday afternoon. It's just been 10 days since that, that unthinkable scene unfolded um, in western Pennsylvania. We'll, we're going to get to Kamala Harris and all that that's happening here in Washington in a moment, but this really, this really burns at you because you were one of the first employees at the Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> What needs to happen to Alejandro Mayorkas? Because there, he, he oversees the Secret Service. I saw the Secret Service director resign. Does he need to yeah. go? Absolutely. And he's the one that's actually ultimately responsible. Actually, I was actually in the first employee at the White House office, so okay. after 9-11. But it's important because we created the department. Right. Um, along, obviously, with President Bush and Congress. But the reason that we put the Secret Service, we took it from Treasury to put it into the White House Office of Homeland Security, or the Office of Homeland Security, is because we needed to make sure that they were coordinating with the other agencies. And it's the biggest mistake that's ever happened, and there's no excuse, and there's so many things I want to unpack right now. One, it's 10 minutes from where I grew up. 
Um, and the fact that there was not, there were not people on the roofs of those buildings yeah. when there was five of them was ap- actually that's something that is unthinkable. One, two, the fact that the Secret Service blamed the local uh, law enforcement for the perimeter. Secret Service makes the perimeter. They're the ones that determine where the perimeter right. was, and it's not their responsibility. It's the Secret Service's pr- responsibility. But going back to your question, because I could go on about this forever. Um, Absolutely, she needed to resign. She did? She did, absolutely. And I've been saying that for the last couple of days. But also, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the buck stops with him. So he told us, uh, he told this country, Scott and Kurt, that there was operational control at the border. When Alejandro Mayorkas says that, how do you trust him going forward on overseeing on overseeing something like this and making decision as to who comes next. I think we have to kind of divorce a little bit the, the, the border situation, which obviously Republicans in Congress moved to impeach Secretary Mayorkas over with this Secret Service situation. Let me tell you something. There have been failure after failure after scandal after scandal in the Secret Service for a very yeah. long time. 2012, Cartagena, prostitution ring. 2014, Amsterdam. 2015, Delaware. One of their agents was found in a child... Uh, porn ring. 2017, when a vice president Mike Pence's uh, detail was found with a prostitute in Maryland. There are long-standing failures organizationally within the Secret Service that have nothing to do with which party is in the office, which secretary is in the office. These are the things that this select committee that's being formed, they need to go deep. And it's not just about the operational failures on that day last Saturday. It's overall in this organization, there have been real problems. So what does it look like going forward? Right, because I have to imagine you're going to have whistleblowers come out. You're going to have stories come out. You're going to hear more of things probably that Kurt just just laid out. I think the legislative process and these uh, hearings that they're going to have, the special committees, is really, really important, Blake. But the implementation of whatever those recommendations are and consistent implementation is going to be key. Uh, And it starts with leadership. How committed is the executive branch, whoever is in office, to cleaning up the Secret Service? They they, They had issues when they were on security detail about five, ten years ago in South America, if you will. You may yep. have mentioned that. But but the real the commitment to excellence and the commitment to the commitment of being excellent has got to come from leadership. And so whoever you put in that place, I actually think getting um, Senate confirmation or House confirmation for the head like of the Secret Service is a good, good idea. Yeah, because I think if, if Joe Biden gets to make the decision now and the next president seemingly will either be Donald Trump or, or Kamala Harris, they'll get to make the decision and so on and so forth. You used to speak for a presidential candidate, Donald Trump, in 2020. And, and I wonder what you make of Donald Trump's reaction today in which he said the Biden and Harris administration did not properly protect me. Are we going to see that out of him going forward? Is that going to be part of his pitch going forward? If there's one thing I learned speaking for Donald Trump, it's don't <laughs> assume what the next answer is going to be. So I will put that there. But on the investigations and on leadership, it's very clear that Secret Service needs a big house cleaning. I think Senate confirmation makes a lot of sense. Yeah. A 10-year term to make it less political and more... Like the FBI director. Yes, like, yeah. Yeah, like remove all of that partisanship. But as we begin this investigation in the House, The name that's being floated right now by Democrats is Benny Thompson to be on that committee. And you better believe that Republicans will stand up and say he was on the J6 committee. He was very politically motivated then. They won't want to see that. And also he put forward legislation to to remove Secret Service protection for Donald Trump as a convicted felon. Right. That is not the type of person. If we want to take this that's seriously... Political. That's purely political. That's, but that's purely political. So if we want to take this seriously, it means that somebody like that should not be on this committee. All right, I so, actually think the well, task force don't work. Yeah, well, why would you not want Benny Thompson on that committee? If it's a bipartisan... Hold on. It's a bipartisan to... commission, and the evidence of January 6th was overwhelming. You could take the politics out of it, even though the politics in it, and if the evidence speaks for so itself. So we talked talk about January him on that committee, aside, wouldn't you? But if you... Let's say... You know, my job is chairing that committee. No, but then let's go and talk about the fact that he tried to remove Secret Service protection for Donald Trump so before an assassination attempt. We t- I believe that's utterly he disqualified. Have the power to do that. He but, but put forward the- legislation to it. I'm yeah. telling you, this we happened. We talked about that here on the show, and at the time, I- to be fair, we pointed out mm-hmm. that would apply to Donald Trump and, and that would Hunter. apply to Hunter Biden. That was why it was ridiculous it's da- on its, its face. It's very dangerous to politicize this and say yes. the Democrats did this to Donald Trump. They know it's not true. There's no causal connection. Still to come here on the Hill over uh, the next 45 minutes or so, the 33-hour campaign. So how did the Democratic Party choose its nominee for virtually no one to see while you might have been sleeping? <laughs> Donald Trump speaking for the first time on Kamala Harris will tell you what he's focusing on. Plus, a live look at the White House, one of the longest-serving White House doctors ever, joins us here on the Hill. 
Who needs to take a cognitive test and when? And have you seen this from Elon? It's AI generated. What's he doing here? You're watching The Hill here on News Nation. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> Welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. So while you might have been sleeping last night, Democrats all but made it official. 33 hours after President Biden dropped out of the race, we learned at around 10 o'clock last night here on the East Coast that Kamala Harris had secured enough delegates to become the Democratic nominee for president. Now today, the Senate Majority Leader, Chuck Schumer, who would not deny when asked that he told President Biden to drop out of the race, he stuck to this line right here about how this all came together seemingly in the past two days. The bottom line, it was a bottom-up process. People just rallied right to her side. The enthusiasm in this big, diverse, representative party was amazing. Now, the vice president is campaigning in the state of Wisconsin today and is also focusing on now naming a running mate. Who might that be? But there are still some within the Democratic Party who are questioning Harris at the top of the ticket. For example, the Democratic mega donor John Morgan, appearing on Cuomo last night. Is she the best one to win? Are we in it to win it? And I don't know. When I think of who could have been there and who is going to be there, I see a lot of other people and a lot of other combinations. All right, so Kamala Harris, Kurt, uh, Scott, she said she wanted to earn this. Those were her words. Actually, let's, and, let, and let's play what Kamala Harris said earlier today out on the trail. I'll get your reaction on the other side. I am told as of this morning that we have earned the support of enough delegates to secure the Democratic nomination. I will spend the coming weeks continuing to unite our party. 33 hours and you got a nominee. Chuck Schumer told me this was a bottom-up process. I went to bed last night. I was laying there in bed like, wait a minute. They chose Kamala Harris. It's all but official. She's got the delegates. Well, behind closed doors, no sunshine. How do you stand behind that? Democrats in array. <laughs> How about that? Democrats got it, it together. Did, the, the, they organized. At least once. They act at least swiftly, once. definitively, <laughs> decisively. That's what I'm talking okay, so about. With, so let me with, with, with the, the delegates who we don't know their faces, their names, their individuals. There are they're some 4,000 of them. And I just learned from the Associated Press and the Washington Post last night, hey, we got our nominee. Hey, look, like, if anyone, like, let I'm me, sorry. I'll, I'll, one, second, one second. If anybody <laughs> wants to challenge her, they are welcome to do so. Not. It says something that all the would-be contenders have decided in their judgment okay. that it is better to get behind the vice president. As the I'm going to hear these as the only As the only state par- <laughs> former state party chair on your panel, mm-hmm. okay, this was a... DC is not a state. Yeah, it, it, it should be, <laughs> but I digress. But you digress. <laughs> <laughs> it was an open competition because anyone could get in, but remember, when Biden resigns, these delegates are released. There are 4,000 of them, right? And they all had... They all conferenced and met as to who they would get behind. Now, Kamala Harris was the only one to step forward. She got powerful recommendations behind her. There were a few that, that uh, Democrats that kind of played with it a little bit, but everyone fell in line because timing is super important and money is super important. Any other combination was unrealistic given the timing and given the amount of money that if you don't use that money under Biden-Harris, she can use it. All of those monies would go to the DNC and how they distribute it would have been chaos if you came with a different uh, piece. Now, here's the deal. Those delegates can commit if you have a, they can still have a floor fight if somebody jumps in, Virtual but they're not call. jumping they're gonna, in. They're going to yeah. shut that Or it's down. done then. then it's, they're they're going to shut that then down. It's done, but, and hence the point. But let's yeah. not make out like this was some private uh, boss meeting where she was appointed and was. everybody <laughs> fell in. <laughs> was it not? No, was it not. It was let's not. be perfectly clear here. Not. Democracy dies at the DNC. Oh, that was please. done behind closed okay. doors. Okay. Democracy <laughs> dies in darkness. And the RNC is the darkest. It was your time birthday out. yesterday, so we'll let it go. Time out, time out. She started I you, it. I let you two go, <laughs> and I want to hear from Aaron and Ashley. Man, it's just like the Democrats. You little coup to throw Joe Biden now, trying to push me off the panel as well here. Let's be clear. The Democrats did not have a bottom-up process here. It was very clear that that Kamala would have known ahead of time and they coalesced quickly. But that's not to say that this was an open, transparent process and you're never going to be able to sell me that the blazer I have on is hot pink and not blue. Well, facts RNC, are facts are weight. 
GOP but loves Kamala conspiracies. Par- but no, let's just. You love conspiracies. Okay, you can say that if you'd like. There are no I, please name one. I please, please name process. one hold on, hold on. that she said she earned it. You don't earn it in 33 hours over 4,000 people. It just doesn't work that way. phone calls. Oh, ooh, wow, 100 she had phone, to make. phone calls. Make someone now a presidential candidate? Are you joking? What'd you do? Let's with be Trump? honest here. Kamala's going to have a wonderful moment in the sun right now. Mm-hmm. Media adoration. But you know what this also includes? Rise. She's going to come up. They're going to like her. Scrutiny. She's not going to be able to handle it and the inevitable decline of the Democratic ticket. And that is because this core nation not allowing the Democrats to have a say in this will come back and bite them. Let me sneak Ashley in here. I think it's all good. And I actually think Republicans probably would have done the same thing. But Donald Trump did win. As I was sitting on the Nikki Haley side and I was sitting on Jeb Bush's side in 2016, mm-hmm. he did win mm-hmm. his elections, Every whether people liked it or not. No, the okay, DMC was followed. Okay, that's fine. I'm okay. not criticizing. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, let her have her praise. Actually, I support women. I support women running for Congress or president, Congress, Senate, whatever. However, I think her time's gonna, it's gonna, let, let her go. And Rise, it's gonna come back decline. down. Yep. Yeah, Democrats in array. Listen, listen Democrats in array. That's, that's the way not, you wanna leave it. This is not the same candidate you saw four years ago running for president. Well, we'll, it well I just matter. don't so believe we'll, She's battle worn. So we'll see, because if, because if not, right, like one of the questions, and this is, we could do this all day, but she was for Medicare for all and to raise taxes by 4% on those who make $100,000 or more. Madam Vice President, are you still for that or are you not? Madam Vice President, the labor unions uh, want Joe Biden to stop sending weapons to Israel. Are you for that or not? Right? These are all Those the are questions. Fair questions. These fair questions. Fair yeah, questions. No, fair questions for She's anyone. For, for anyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you. And we're so, she and that her, is what she we're going to have her time, and yeah. then we'll see in a couple She's days. All right. Still much more ahead here on the Hill, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, the ultimate prize, right? And with the president now out of the race, some Republicans are calling on him to step aside completely. Donald Trump becomes the oldest presidential nominee in U.S. history at 78 years old. So who needs to take a cognitive test, if at all, and when one of the longest serving White House physicians of all time joins us next here on The Hill? Plus, tune in for a News Nation special report. The plot to kill Trump. Brian Enten hosts live from Pennsylvania the unanswered questions about what went wrong. Thursday, 10 o'clock Eastern, right here on News Nation. We're back in a few. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. Tonight, President Biden is back to work in the White House after a bout with COVID. Upon returning today, the president said he's quote unquote feeling well. The 81 year old president was isolated for five days at his vacation home in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. During his treatment plan, President Biden received 10 doses of the medication Paxlovid. Today, the White House physician, Dr. Kevin O'Connor, said the president never had a fever. His vital signs are normal and his lungs remain clear. Now, among the many questions that have been discussed and put before the president himself, should candidates running for the Oval Office be required to take a cognitive test? And should there be an age limit? In a New York Times op-ed, one of the longest serving White House physicians, Dr. Jeffrey Kuhlman, says political parties should ensure by every objective that those in in government are qualified to make decisions. Dr. Kuhlman worked in the White House medical unit for 13 years under the George W. Bush and Obama administrations. He's also the author of the new book, Transforming Presidential Healthcare, and joins us live here on the Hill. Dr. Kuhlman, thanks for being with us. Appreciate the time, sir. Explain uh, explain to us in the audience, who do you think uh, in government should be taking a cognitive test? Um, I watched uh, President Obama, President Bush, President Clinton firsthand. Being president is a physically and mentally Uh, demanding job. Um, When we talk about cognitive ability, cognitive ability is, it's the ability of the brain to reason, uh, to recall memory, to have brain speed, and spatial visualizations. Humans, we peak about age 30, it kind of is flatline till 60, and it goes downhill rapidly after the age of 60. So there's no requirement today to do any cognitive ability but it, it just seems common sense that um, you can either do an age limit or you can, uh, the job of a physician is to do a, either a cognitive screen or just move straight to like a four hour neurocognitive mm-hmm. assessment. So you talk about sort of the, the straight downhill line. I wanna show our audience uh, the graphic. I found this fascinating, doctor. 
which talks about it shows as you go along and get older in life, what you become better at and what you become slower at. So vocabulary, you can see you get better at in life, right? That makes tons of sense as we grow older, get smarter. But when it comes to spatial visualization, reasoning, and memory, um, along with speed, you can see there, as you sort of outlined, in your mid-50s, maybe when you, when you get to 60, you start to drop below average. I'm looking at the age of the presidential, uh, of the man in the Oval Office. He's 81. Kamala Harris wants to be president. She's right there along that line at 59. Donald Trump is well past it at 78. J.D. Vance uh, is going to be turning 40 here. So, wh- like, who, do you, who would you test? Would you test J.D. Vance at 40? Would you test... Kamala Harris at basically 60, would you test Joe Biden at, at 80 and Donald Trump at 80? Um, well, they each have a physician assigned to them um, at the White House Medical Unit. Um, you, we don't screen uh, for no reason. Um, but mm-hmm. if there's a reason to, to um, evaluate a patient, um, then you can either do a 10-minute cognitive screen or you can move straight to a neurologist. What, what I would propose is either age 70, um, at age 70, um, maybe every year, you do a four-hour neuro- neurocognitive assessment if you're the president or the vice president or you're seeking that office. Um, and that would not only give us a baseline, that then over time we could see if there's changes. Um, former President Trump is 78, but the next four years yep. he's gonna, he would be 82. Um, so you have to have that that baseline. So um, unless you have a reason, I would pick age 70. Okay. There are Republicans in this town, doctor, who are saying, you know what, if Joe Biden couldn't run for president, then why is he still the commander in chief? Do you think that is a reasonable argument that they're making or do you not see a connection there? Um, So my, my mantra has always been no politics, no policy, just trusted medical advice. So my trusted medical advice is um, uh, his personal physician, who's known him since uh, 2009, um, is assessing his his neurocognitive ability. um, And and in February, uh, we saw that he set him up to see a respected neurologist um, at Walter Reed, um, and they evaluated him. If there's been a change since February, um, he would want him to... um, get evaluated. If, if he is at the same as February, then that's an appropriate. Um, he got him to the neurologist to get evaluated. So those are separate things than the physical stamina of campaigning for four for more months. Did, did, I wonder, and, and I hear you speaking about Dr. O'Connor, but I wonder if you think in their response, sort of pushing back on the media repeatedly over the course of months at the White House, uh, before and after the debate, I wonder if, if you think that the American public was let down in any form as it relates to what we got out of the White House. Um, well, the, um, the White House physician has two jobs. One is to um, give the best possible medical advice to their patient and to those um, around him. So that's, that's job one. And then second is to be candid with the American people about um, the ability of, of um, uh, the president uh, to perform their duties. So that's, um, you, th- those are kind of the two things that you always have to okay. keep in mind every single day. Dr. Jeffrey Kuhlman, he's the author of Transforming Presidential Healthcare, White House physician uh, over, I believe, he said three presidential administrations and joins us live here on the Hill. Doctor, I could talk to you all day, but we got to leave it there. Thank you, sir. Good to see you, Blake. You as well. Um, So 70 is the recommendation for him. And I think most Americans would say, yeah, seems like pretty pretty reasonable reasonable to me. Yeah, but all 70-year-olds are not equal. No, Uh, I'm not saying they are. But uh, so I wouldn't be against, uh, I would be against an age limitation. What I would be for, though, and I think makes sense, is um, uh, the neurological examinations at various points. But the one thing I wonder about, and I'd be interested in perhaps the panel, if, 
if I'm your personal physician, I'm the president of the United States, how much pressure is it on me to take a as positive an outlook on your mental peace and neurological peace as opposed to an independent medical review so here, of my records so or my I'll examination? As a reporter who covered the what correspondent who uh, covered the White House for four and a half years, it is grueling. As a correspondent, yeah. you worked in, in the uh, building, you spoke for a former president, like being in that, I couldn't even imagine being the president of the United mm -hmm. States. No, absolutely. I but what agree about with the you, independent I don't blame age please. limits either. Yeah. But I do think a test is fine, but I don't think you can say at 70 you're this and at 75 you're that. But should it be from your personal physician or from an independent? I think an review? independent because I actually don't believe in any of the physicians. Yeah. But this guy, he was a White House physician. Yeah, mm -hmm. he was So that's he was right different. There. That He came in with mm -hmm. every president. Yeah, so I would believe him more than I would believe All right. the personal. So obviously President Biden in office for the next six months. The White House says he's going to continue on with his job. President Biden back at the White House tonight. But a lot of the focus now shifts to the vice president, Kamala Harris. She was out on the campaign trail for the first time today in the state of Wisconsin. And it is some of what we will see from the vice president going on forward, of course, in the next 106 days. Joining us now is the Democratic Congresswoman from California, the home state of Kamala Harris, Maxine Waters. Congresswoman, thanks for being with us here on the Hill. Appreciate it. Um, You're welcome. You, know, you got it. I wish I had more time with you, and I do appreciate you coming to the camera for us. But obviously there's been the, the jubilation and the joy among many Democrats as all this, this sets in. But now as we start to to sort of scrutinize what is Kamala Harris's record, what does she stand for. Um, I, I wonder what you make of her support, Congresswoman, during her past presidential campaign for the idea of Medicare for all and imposing a 4% tax on those households that make more than $100,000 each to pay for it. Well, first of all, let me just say this. I would not compare uh, what happened in her last campaign with what is going on now. I do believe uh, that since she has been in the White House as the vice president working with President Biden, uh, that she has worked as a team to help formulate the public policy in the way that they collectively think about it. So for me, uh, this is basically starting a new and a new campaign for president with all of the additional information and experiences she's had. No, I, I hear you, um, and it's a, it's a fair point to say, you know what, she's the vice president, but doesn't she then own the American public, the responsibility, Congresswoman, of here's my tax plan, uh, here's my health care plan, uh, here's how I will deal with Social Security and Medicare, so on and so forth, because, yes, she is the current vice president, and I just wonder when we're going to get that from her, because the American people want to know. Well, uh, that's, that's fine, and that's what the campaign is all about. Uh, they will have to campaign, will have to talk about themselves, what they believe in, uh, and, you know, where the future of this country is going. All of that comes out during the campaign. These decisions is only, uh, what, 48 hours uh, old or so, so she cannot have done all of that now. But, of course, I look forward uh, to her talking more about herself and about what she believes, what she thinks, and what she believes she can do as the president of the United States. Of course, we expect all of that. Why should Americans feel comfortable, Congresswoman, with what we saw over the last 36 hours, which was basically the Washington Post, the Associated Press, and other outlets telling us at 10 o'clock last night, oh, she's got the delegates, here we are, she, she's the nominee. It doesn't seem like a process played out. And I wonder what you would tell Democrats who, who think, you know what, maybe my voice wasn't heard. Well, let me tell you this. Uh, she has racked up the delegates. Uh, as of today, she has enough delegates uh, to become the president going into the convention. Uh, we know that has happened. As a matter of fact, my California, my state, helped to put her over. And she's earned that. Nobody's given that to her. She's earned it with a tough career uh, that she's paid attention to, that she's worked, she has grown, she's experienced, and she served as the vice president of the United States. So she's earned the right uh, to be received in the wonderful way that she is being received with all of those delegates who are coming on board and all the money uh, that's coming in unexpectedly. Do, do you Everybody really feel that she earned it? Absolutely surprised. Oh, yes, she really earned it. As vice because president, I, yes, yeah, she I, earned I'm it. So, I'm sorry to talk over you. There's obviously a delay, but there's a difference between being the vice president and being next one up and then sort of going out and 
and explaining to the Democratic Party why you're the one. It, it happens so fast. Well, you know, think about what you're saying. Uh, what background did Trump have? What experiences did he have? Uh, he did the same thing everybody has to do, and that's to go out and to sell yourself and to explain whom you are, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know why you're trying to make these differences between her and other candidates. Of course, well, she's going to campaign. But they know more about her than they knew about Trump when he ran. They have seen her as vice president. She has been on the domestic agenda, on the foreign affairs agenda. She has traveled to other 20 countries uh, in this okay. world, on and on and on. They know something I, I about just, her. I, I, I would just note Donald Trump did go through a primary process in 2016. But as we run, Congresswoman, um, who do you want to see as her vice presidential pick? I'm not talking about whom I want to see. It's up to the one, our nominee, our nominee going into the convention, and her advisors and her family and all of them, they will be talking about that. She's looking at various ones. I've seen some that I thought sounded good, looked good, but I'm not trying to uh, give my okay. opinion on that at all. Congresswoman Maxine Waters, a Democrat from the state of California, nice to speak with you again. As always, Congresswoman, appreciate the time. Well, thank you. Thank you so course, very you, much. You got it. All right, still coming up here from the Hill. The brand new reaction from Donald Trump to Kamala Harris. Other side of the break. Stay with us. Thursday, a News Nation special report. The plot to kill Trump. Reliving the moment of crisis as it unfolded on air. News Nation's Brian Enton shares the latest on the investigation. Where did security go wrong? New interviews and exclusive details. Thursday at 10, 9 central, only on News Nation. Tonight, how does Donald Trump plan on beating his new opponent, Kamala Harris. Well, the Trump's ca Trump campaign's latest strategy, in part, attack Harris and try to tie her to the president's failed policies, as they see it, along the southern border. On a press call earlier today, Trump came out going right after Harris on one of the biggest issues, the border. If she becomes president, Kamala Harris will make the invasion exponentially worse and just like she did with San Francisco, just like she did with the border, our whole country will be permanently destroyed. So when Donald Trump says that, you, she's going to say what? He's or, nuts. What the hell is he even talking about? Oh, that's not, that's, that's, not that's, that's not the answer. You know that's not the answer. She was the, the, no, 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 I'm just saying she was like, the immigration like Everything's going to be destroyed. Yeah. No, it's going to be an invasion. Was. This is such yes, a tired was. playbook okay, that we've oh, heard over go. and over and over again for Republicans. And you know what? It doesn't work. They tried that in the midterms. The invasion, the caravans, all that didn't work. No one's going to go for that. That's not going to... That, but she's not setting herself up. She's supposed to be in Texas on Thursday, and she's not going to the border. Donald Trump's already framing this conversation before she hits the ground on immigration. They will be out there aggressively campaigning on immigration when she's in Texas. You better believe this will hit her no, hard quickly. It'll, and I think it'll, the, it'll and hit her hard for the Republican. The choice is going to be, though, it'll, it'll, is are you more afraid of the border, or are you more afraid of having control over your own body? That's the border. That's Kamala Harris is going to border. Yeah, as a, as a lady. That say, is so that's important to the Republicans. I think it's <laughs> important to a lot of the country. Well, it's, one but the, it's like but, one of the But have you, have you, countries. when's the last time you covered the border and you had hundreds of people or thousands of people no, coming no. across the border? Since the executive order, it's been cut in half and on the no. downward trend since he executed the, did the executive order. And so the whole immigration piece, the Republicans want to keep it going because it's a great talking point for them prior to the executive orders. But you're not covering the border right now. You know why? Because it's been shut down and it's been cut in half. I think so that dog won't hunt. Well, the American people know sort of what happened under Biden and, and where things had gone over the last and few years. comes way, out was, with a strong statement three, against the, about the border. Yep. That was three years too late. Uh -huh. He did that executive okay. order one. And all the bad people that want to hurt us are Well, I want to talk the about the future and, and now so, as opposed to past. And that's a great point because, again, she is going to be asked, the vice president, now the Democrat, presumptive Democratic nominee for president, is going to be asked, Madam Vice President, you said uh, back in 2019 that you wanted a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. Do you still stand there? So on and so forth yes. and on down the line. And again, that's why I keep bringing up these issues, because while we're focusing on Kamala Harris right now, and rightfully so, it's going to come down to the issues at some point in time. All right, before we go, did you happen to see this? Elon Musk posting a video on X today of what he called an AI fashion show. <laughs> Shows a number of uh, politicians around the is world walking person? down the runway. We'll let the video go. Again, this is AI generated. <laughs> what do you think Elon's doing here? What do you see, Aaron? 
I see silliness, but I also see the fact that he put Xi Jinping in there, and that could be a real problem for him when he's doing with business Tesla. with China. They yeah. do not like anybody making fun of him. What do you see there, Kurt? I see a guy with too much time on his hands. <laughs> Ashley? Oh, it's creative, but not, I don't really have anything to say. To be no. honest with I, you. See okay. a, I see the Democratic nominee pro- provocatively <laughs> dressed. Yeah. <laughs> that, I would see that, but I, yeah. And I mean, I, it, I'm it, sorry. It is the infancy of AI. There, there you go. right there. Oh, so again, <laughs> AI generated the infancy of AI, but just think about where we were with the internet back in 2000, give or take, and now where we are 25 years ago later. You got to wonder where all this runs in the upcoming years. All right. Donald Trump, Joe Biden, you know, they went at it for weeks over, of all things, their <laughs> golf game. <laughs> So what is Trump doing now alongside the U.S. Open champ? Leland Vitter joins us on the other side of the break. You're watching The Hill. All right, welcome back to The Hill here on News Nation. So before we say goodbye, here's a story that caught our eye. Donald Trump making a surprise appearance on the popular YouTube channel of the U.S. Open champion Bryson DeChambeau. The former president and the two-time champ partnered up for a challenge, uh, worked together to shoot under 50 on one of Trump's golf courses. This was how it all ended. Get in there. Oh. Let's go! <laughs> Let's get, yes. That's how we do it! Yes. Oh, that's how you finish off the round. <laughs> we shot 22 under. <laughs> oh my gosh. Do you have to break 50, you can't just get to 50. <laughs> well, we'll do it again. We'll have to do it again next time. We'll do it again. You have to break it, right? Leland Vittert, host of On Balance. I, sh- I should note they raised $220,000 for charity here. Part of the reason why they do it. So, so there you go. Work playing on, on playing from the ladies' tees to see if they can yes. do it. Uh, you know what's funny is Donald Trump seems to be living his best life now. You think so? I mean, playing play, play with the U.S. Open play, champs, seeing if you can break 50 and having fun. with Tiger as president and stuff like that. I, there, there, there seems to be, and you've covered him for a long time, so have I, at least over the past week and a half, there seems to be a difference in his affect and a mm. big difference in the affect that he is letting people see. This video would not have been made when he was president. It wouldn't no. have been made three years ago. No. Uh, Bryson DeChambeau, too, essentially sort of reinventing himself and his personality via 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 and 